Oh, here we go. Welcome back everyone to the Global Quantum Computing and Entrepreneurship Program. Everyone is joining the session. We will wait a minute until everyone is in. Very exciting session today with three panelists from INQ and then Photonic Quantum Computing with Stefano Paisani. More and more people are coming, so we will give each other a little bit of time. Raj is the host for today. Thank you very much, Raj, for doing the technical background in addition to organizing so much as one of the founders of the Romanian Foundation. Still more coming into the waiting room from all over the world. We have more than 88 countries, more than 44% women, which is very special in this field. Usually it is only 10%. We have participants at postdoc level, PhD, master, all the way down to high school, extremely enthusiastic and engaged people starting their quantum journeys. Many participants also helping out with video editing, making summaries, helping each other. This morning, there was a session organized by Yi Ning to help each other with the exercises. We extremely appreciate how everyone works together and that will prove even more valuable in the hackathon that will start in one and a half, two weeks, which will be very exciting with real problems posed by companies. Then we will get started. Welcome back everyone. It is morning over here, but I know it can be afternoon or evening or even night at your places. We have a quantum hardware session today after also having had a lot of programming and software the past days. Two topics, we will start with trapped ion quantum computing and then we will have a lecture on photonic quantum computing. And that topic is new so far, we didn't discuss it yet. Very excited to announce our panel today. We have three panelists from IonQ, a trapped ion startup, trapped ion quantum computing startup here in the US, it is close to my place at the East Coast, close to Washington DC. And we have here Corey Williams, a quantum OS engineer, Wenlin Tan, senior physicist, and Monica Gutierrez Galan, senior physicist as well at INQ. Could you give a brief introduction to yourselves in the order, Corey, Wenlin, Monica? Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Corey. Um, I'm a quantum OS engineer, and that basically means that I work on the software that uh, is used to actually control our quantum computers. Um, currently, our main users are physicists um, internal in our company, um, but we hope to create an operating system that's kind of like the one on your computer where anyone can use it um, to really uh, utilize the power of quantum computing. Amazing. Wenlin? Uh, hi, I'm Wenlin Tan. I'm a senior physicist at IonQ. So my job here is uh, working uh, with a bunch of senior physicists to build the best quantum computer in the world. And, and also as I collaborate with a lot of amazing people uh, to integrate software, hardware, like optical mechanical design so that the, we can build a good quantum computer. The best quantum computing in the best world. Quantum computer. Big aspirations, and we would love to hear more about that in this session. Monica? Uh, hi, everyone. I am Monica Gutierrez Galan. I am a senior physicist at IonQ as well. And I just like Wenlin work on development of the new hardware that we will continue to integrate into the best quantum computers in the world. Amazing. Wenlin, could you give us a recap? How does a trapped ion quantum computing work? So a uh, trapped ion quantum computer is, has a lot of parts, but the fundamental part is uh, you need to trap an ion. So basically ion trap is like a, uh, you requires RF and DC 
control and to in order to confine the ions in the trap. And after that, we will use lasers to cool the atoms and also ions in order to just like hold the ions like steady in the trap. And uh, and after we can trap the ions, we just like we we will we will do what we call a ground state cooling just to make the ion as cool as possible. Just like so that there's no like like uh, what we call uh, phonons inside, the, as little phonons inside in the ions. And after that, we can just like do quantum operation by shining like uh, more laser into the atoms. For example, you do like single qubit operation or entangling gate operation. So that's how trap ions. So in trap ions platform, all the qubits are similar because it's just like all, all the atoms are the same. Yes, and that is a unique approach compared to some other quantum computing approaches. Within the trapped ion quantum computing world, Corey, what is IonQ's approach? Um, we, uh, so within trapped ion uh, computing, one thing that makes us different is that we're actually a publicly traded company. We're the only peer play um, quantum computing company. Um, and so we're really trying to utilize that funding to both um, really uh, expand the boundaries of quantum computing and our uh, research and development systems. And then we also have actual production systems that um, anyone can use. And I'm sure some of you guys have used um, through uh, uh, SDKs like uh, AWS and, um, and, and stuff like that. Now you all have different jobs uh, at INQ. Could you tell a bit more about that? Monica, what is your role as a senior physicist? So I work on the side of the company that is more R&D. So currently I, without too much of the specifics, I work on developing hardware that will be integrated in the future to enhance or improve the functioning of our quantum computers. And what does that mean on a daily basis? If you um, get that IQ well, in the morning, what does developing hardware mean? I do a variety of things. I think every day is very different, but I I do a lot of reading. I read papers constantly. So that feels a lot like grad school, I would say. Uh, however, it's like a very, very, I have a very well-defined project or goal that I'm trying to achieve. So it's, a combination of reading, planning, um, the scoping the hardware that is available for integration, modeling. So I do mathematical modeling. It's, uh, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> is that similar for you, Van Lien? You are also a senior physicist. Uh, I, I work in a different department than Monica. So basically my task is like, uh, I take the quantum device that IonQ developed and put it into a system or just like a, a testing site to see how does the like uh, electronics or device react with the ions. So that's my role. And also depending on the, the uh, result on the device, I can just like feedback to the development team and say, oh, this is, uh, this is happening, and then can we improve it more? Great, great individual tasks and great teamwork. Then we have a lab tour coming up now, a video shot at INQ, and Corey will start it. Great. In the meantime, I would like to thank two of your colleagues at INQ, Eva Cole, who assembled this great panel for us and arranged the video that we can show it here, and Annie Philipson, who also arranged that we can show this video here. Corey will take away the Zoom controls. And I see the first questions appearing on Discord. Great, thank you very much. We will ask the whole Q&A after this video. So stay tuned and ask all your questions on Discord. Um, can you see the video? Yeah, okay. Cool. You can see the video. Great.
At INQ, we build quantum computers that are based on individual atoms. This is one of our earliest prototypes of a quantum computer, and if you come close, you can see at this core, there's a vacuum chamber. It looks like a lot of plumbing. That's the key to a quantum computer, is the isolation of the individual atoms. They can't have air striking them all the time. These atoms are floating in space. They're not part of a surface. They're not part of a solid. And if you look closely, there's a chip hanging upside down. It has a bunch of electrodes, and the atoms hang on those electrodes. It's sort of like a magnetically levitated train, only our train, uh, uh, those are individual atoms, and these are electrically levitated, not magnetically. We control our atoms that form the basis of the quantum computer with laser beams and optics. Those beams and those optical elements are themselves controlled by uh, very fancy electronic uh, devices. We have to build all that stuff in-house. We have to own the entirety of the controller system. You can't just uh, buy an entire system that way. We can buy components, but we have to build it ourselves. In one of our more mature electronic controllers in here, uh, you can see a bunch of cables coming off of devices. Um, each one of those cables will send a signal that will eventually guide a laser beam to a single atom, one cable per atom. These are, again, the way we control the algorithm that we're programming, initialization of the quantum bits, the qubits, and also their measurement. We don't mind that the electronic racks are maybe large. We know how to shrink those in the future. They'll all be integrated onto a single chip. We don't need to do that just yet, but in the future, we have definite plans on miniaturizing the whole footprint of the entire system. To package our quantum computers, uh, we require a dust-free environment. Uh, the chip and so forth are inside of a vacuum chamber. And so we have this clean room here that allows us to assemble things in a very clean manner so that the system will behave. We don't do fabrication of our chip. We can farm that out, but we have to integrate it and we have to package it. And in here you can see a couple of gold chips. Uh, these have a bunch of electrodes that will eventually support individual atoms. We apply electrical potentials to these electrodes and then when the atoms are there, they are trapped. They can't go anywhere. And here we have a couple of our latest generation quantum computers that have many more qubits than the previous versions. Uh, as you can see, these big black enclosures allow us to control the environment under which these computers are operating. The system and this big box is running jobs as we speak. And these jobs are uploaded to a cloud provider that allows anybody with an account with AWS, Amazon, or Microsoft Azure, or Google Cloud Platform to run jobs on this particular hardware. Our quantum computers are getting very small with every generation, and in the future, we have uh, very well-defined plans to put everything you see in this big black box on a single rack-mounted device that can be wired to other rack-mounted devices with optical fibers, very much like a data center. We're gonna to have to have the atoms talk to other atoms on a different chip via optical fibers. We've done all of the research behind that type of an interface, and at INQ, we're translating that laboratory work into a reality, into a commercial product. One aspect of computer design, quantum computer or any computer design, is that the software level is incredibly important, and it has to be integrated so that the users can get on and use these things to solve problems and not worry about individual atoms. So our job is to make our system so stable and accurate that the users uh, will be able to solve certain types of problems much faster than they could using any other type of computer. At INQ, we have a very diverse set of skills from atomic physicists like me all the way to software and algorithm engineers. And so it's very important for us to have an environment where we bump into each other and we have these collisions between people with very, very different skill sets. And I think our goal here is to allow the user of quantum computers to not know or care what's inside the computer. Very much like how we use cell phones today. This was a fantastic video. Thank you so much. Showing everything from the chip to the lab and then the collisions between people with different skill sets, which is also the case among you and the case among all our participants. And there are opportunities for everyone in this quantum computing world. There are several questions being posted. Uh, David asks, what is the coherency time at the INQ system at the moment? Coherence time. 
And you could also tell something about gate fidelity and other specs. Then Lynn. Oh, I can. Uh, so I cannot tell much about it, the details about this, but in trap mining system, uh, there's like there's like research publication that the coordinates time of a trap mining system can be uh, go like um, hours. So the quantum platform for trap mining gets like has one of the longer coordinates times for the qubit. So. Do we have other questions? And uh, Monica, what is the number of qubits at INQ at the moment? And what does qubit connectivity look like? Is it full? Shoria USA asks. Uh, I think we have a publication with those numbers. I cannot speak as to the current state. I can only tell you about the latest. We can only talk about what has been published. <laughs> yeah, say. that we understand. Um, off the top of my head, I, I don't remember. It's fully connected, but I don't. We have some really nice papers where you can see a plot with connectivity of all of the ions. Mm -hmm. I was not prepared to show papers. <laughs> <laughs> I think Very good. On the older systems, um, I believe it's around like 11 qubits. That's like the, the ones that are production level now. And then I think with our um, newer systems, it's more like 32. Um, and those are, are like released to like not, those aren't released to the, for public use right now, um, but they will be soon. And to yeah, go higher, Juliana in Italy asks, as far as scalability is concerned, what are INQs designs of ion traps that enable 50 or 100 qubits or more? So, uh, 100 qubits or more. So we, th there's like a long ways to do it. And there's like, of course, there's like a company, I cannot speak too much about this. If I go 50 ions, you can just like do uh, 50 ion in a chain and then we can, um, Shine still can just like do quantum operation with that, but there's like multiple schemes. Like for example, having multiple traps, and then you do like um like quantum connectivity. It's just like ion to speak to another trap, to another another ion in another trap. So that's one of the ways. Uh, and then ion is as well a lot of ways to scale up, and we are working hard. And then maybe maybe once we are mature enough, we will. I just like announce it. Then uh, Lewis asks, ooh, and let me first uh, do Sandra's question from Mexico. What type of elements do you use? Um, do you use in your trapped ion quantum computers? What kind of atoms <laughs> that then become ions? Hi. So, which um, chemical element? On uh, the production systems, we use ytterbium, um, which is ionized, and the other people on this panel can speak more about that, but um, that's the only reason. The, the system online, it uses ytterbium 171, and then um, I, I think with last year, we made a press release that we are working on barium. That's great. And Monica, the paper you were referring to is already being posted. <laughs> single ion qubit with estimated coherence time exceeding one hour, if that is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. Uh, Sharma had the same question. What kind of ions are you using? Now, Taha from Algeria asks, what could be a significant advantage of ion-trapped quantum computers compared to neutral atom quantum computers that are also really strongly coming up right now? Venlin, what is your take on oh, this? Me. Uh, so the, the thing is like, oh, there's like, I, I will, I'm an iron trapper, so I'll be biased to an iron trapping. And, okay. and there's okay. like, my my expertise towards neutral atom is not that deep, but I would say that iron trapping has been doing, uh, has a very mature uh, control to do QB operation. And this doesn't say that uh, neutral atoms is 
is behind. But I know that nutrient atoms are people are hard at work to make things work. I, I think this is like a a sign that uh, all platforms can all platforms are developing their techniques. And I would say that Ion Trap has their technique developed, but now Ion Cube is like perfecting the engineering. So another thing that uh, back to the like uh, comment about coherence time and entanglement connectivity is it does like it's constantly being improved. So so we get a bit the numbers we get a bit miss up, but we also at the same time we would like to protect the company's like uh, development. So whatever is out on the paper is can be discussed. Yeah, and then we should have the same panel next year and see all the new answers. <laughs> Monica, um, in the ion trap, the qubit is trapped by magnetic fields. And due to the magnetic fields, wouldn't there be Zeeman effects that can affect the qubit coherence time? Mohammed Shuraim from Pakistan asks. How does it uh, work with Zeeman effects due to the magnetic fields for these qubits? Well, we... We use electric fields to trap the ions. That is one of the advantages of using ions as opposed to neutral atoms. Because they are charged, you can use electric fields, whereas with neutral atoms, you have to use different techniques to trap the, the neutral atoms. Um, as for Zeeman effects, any system that is in the presence of magnetic fields will have some Zeeman splitting but you can always choose which states you use so that you can avoid effects of semen um, splitting. And Sharma already uh, adds cleverly, how about the Stark effect if you use electric fields? Uh, whenever you have electric fields or light fields, you will have all of the interactions that come with that. So we calibrate, you always have in any atomic or, or ion trap system, you have a starship, so you have to calibrate them very well. Yeah. Then a question for you, Corey. Thank you, Monica. This is a long question from uh, Giuliana in Italy. One of the problems of the current Qiskit porting for IonQ devices is that IBM runtime are not supported. So basically for a variational quantum algorithm, you are obliged to submit each circuit run in the optimization loop as a separate job in the execution queue. Have you already developed something like IBM runtime to ease the life of variational algorithm programmers? I do. Um, I actually am not super um, familiar with our like cloud offerings because I work on the software that's more internally used. Um, so I, ha I don't know. <laughs> but this might be a very good suggestion to give to your colleagues to yeah, implement. Definitely. A question for, for all three of you, what are some of the main challenges INQ is facing? with respect to ion trapping or the future of ion trapped quantum computing? It's like, uh, what I think is that what um, Chris was saying in the in the video, uh, it's like trying to make things small so that you can have fit everything in the data center. That's why uh, now in for trap ions, we have all the technique developed and now it's trying to just like perfect it in industry. So those are the challenges to make things good and stable and so that it will be robust for everyone to use the quantum computer. I think also the, um, as we add more qubits to our chain and then eventually have actually like multiple chains, um, there are a lot of like, um, Real, I, I would, uh, it looks like very complicated um, interactions when you have um, a chain and you're like shuttling it, when you're moving it, um, when you just have a longer chain of more qubits, the interactions there. Um, so all of that is, uh, we're really working hard to um, make sure that we can keep the fidelity high um, as we like rapidly expand our qubit number. And you're talking about chains, is that the architecture or are you also exploring other shapes and architectures? 
Are there chains for the most for all of it, right, guys? Yeah. Yes. 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 Chain. Then oh, no. Mahima Matthews uh, from India asks, what what is the ideal depth for the circuits for the 11 qubits INQ device in order to avoid noisy results? Corey? Benlin unmuting? Yeah. I, I think this is uh, back to the topic. Back to the answer. I'm not the most familiar because I'm not in the application team. <laughs> and all three was uh, uh, not in the team. So we will circle back to that question to our dear coworker in the application team. <laughs> Very interesting questions. What applications are most suitable for your quantum computers or which perform in a, in a great way in INQ QPUs? Is it, for example, QML, uh, quantum chemistry applications? Uh, Juliana from Italy asks. We are definitely um, uh, hard at work exploring the chemistry applications of quantum computing. Um, we have a partnership um, with uh, different uh, like electric battery um, companies um, to kind of explore um, that realm. Um, and then we also are looking into um, financial applications of quantum computing um, because it's, uh, you can have like a, there's a, a non-negligible effect of using a quantum computer over a classical computer and some kind of financial ag algorithms. Then could you draw a comparison with superconducting quantum computing, which is, is becoming more and more prevalent by several big companies? Uh, what is the computing time or speed, David asks? And I think you have some more um, specs that you could compare it with. Or why are you in trapped ion quantum computing and not in superconducting? Uh, wait, I can answer that from my perspective. Great. Uh, my background in physics is in atomic physics. In, so I'm an experimental physicist working with originally neutral atoms. So my background is laser vacuum systems control using lasers, magnetic fields, and so on. So. Personally, I find the, 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 the hardware very interesting. I think uh, for the time being, the people in this panel are mostly hardware oriented people, which is why some of the theoretical questions are a little bit harder to answer from our perspective. But I think the maturity of the hardware and it's just a personal interest for the hardware. Then Lynn? I don't know. And also your general take on it. Will trapped ion com quantum computers be the future or superconducting or else? Oh, this question varies from person to person. Uh, for, for me, uh, I, I think it's good that you have like all platform to, to develop, like to pursue a goal. And I say that every single platform has their pros and cons. And so I chose uh, trapped ions because, oh, I can use my backgrounds like atomic physics, like uh, similar to uh, Monica, where I manipulate atoms or ions with light. But from my perspective, uh, like it was very encouraging that so many people are pursuing uh, quantum com computing with so many platforms. So because this is like one of the like collective effort to advance this field. I, I won't say uh, who is the best in terms of like quantum platform, but for my personal personal view, I I my experience trap ions, so I think it's pretty a pretty strong candidate for for the quantum quantum platform. Thank you very much, David from USA asks. Couldn't it be that trap ions are very good for quantum memory? but too slow for computation. 
Could you get your view on that? And then what are your thoughts on quantum memory in these systems? Uh, that's so true. Uh, ion, trap ions are long coil in time. And, and because we're utilizing the interaction for, for between the ions is that it will be a bit slower. And, but it still can be a good platform for quantum computing because of the string back to coherence time. And then our entang entangling gates are on a decent time square, time scale. Then about the applications to quantum simulation, Nasser from Algeria asks, what about using trapped ions for quantum simulation? Can you, for example, simulate Ising models using your system? I, I think I'm gonna take it. Uh, I did my PhD uh, using, doing quantum simulation and I simulate Ising model. And yeah, it's, it's a good platform for quantum simulation. So basically in my view, there's like quantum simulation is a subset of universal quantum computer and building a, a universal, universal quantum computer is very challenging. And so, it's very strategic to develop more physics knowledge using quantum simulation, which doesn't require the universal quantum computer, computer uh, uh, ability. So, so multiple, you can see that like multiple groups are doing quantum simulation with trap ions. Great. Corey, a question from Demi from Austin, USA. What has been the most difficult thing to learn or adjust to coding on a quantum computer versus a classical computer? Yeah, um, it's it's interesting. I work on the software that actually like runs the computer. Um, so you can also build software that actually runs on the computer, if that makes sense. Um, and it's kind of the difference between like an application on your computer versus the actual operating system. Um, but in terms of building the actual operating system, um, it's it's interesting how much you actually do have to learn about the quantum physics um, in order to design software, in order to control a quantum computer. I guess it's not super surprising, um, but I think in a lot of software fields, you can kind of abstract away a lot of the details of your hardware. Um, but because we're working, um, with hardware that's like changing a lot um, and that hardware that we are kind of still uh, like doing research with and discovering new things about, you have to have a, a pretty good understanding of what's actually going on in order to write software for it. And I think that that is definitely like a unique um, situation um, to have such an ever-changing and, and complicated set of hardware to run your software on. Good to hear. Shoria from USA asks, have you tried setting up quantum networks with trapped ion quantum computers? Not yet. <laughs> uh, quantum networks is like this, the, this wording. Uh, so I can just like throw another inf information. I mean, in, in academia, as like you can see like papers are being and done to do quantum networks. For example, in trap ions, you can do like uh, ion to ion entanglement with like two two different traps. And then those information are connected well, uh, optical fiber. So this is a very well studied uh, research in the academia. Great, Shilan from Poland asks about career opportunities what level of expertise is required for those who look for opportunities to work in such a lab? And are those with a theoretical background also qualified? Corey, go ahead, I see you're nodding. Um, I, was not, I was nodding because I don't have a background in, in quantum physics. So uh, there's that. So you um, have a definitely. background in computer science and economics. Yeah, um, so it's definitely possible. I think especially if you wanna work in engineering in this field, like. Um, you kind of, in order to, if you want to build your own quantum computing company, you kind of have to have a core set of experimental uh, quantum physicists. Um, and then around them, for every one of those, you need like uh, someone to work on software, someone to work on like electrical engineering, someone to work on the mechanical engineering of the actual 
um, hardware. Um, so it's definitely possible to work in the engineering sector um, without much quantum computing experience at all. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. You go ahead, Monica. Yeah, I was going to add that as far as theories, I think it depends on your theoretical background. Yeah, but people with a background in atomic molecular optical physics, either experimental or theoretical, are right up our alley. I, and like, like Corey said, we have a great team of experts in a diverse set of things like electronics, control, computer science, and so on. Yeah. Then as the concluding round, we have many participants here and even many more watching async. What is your message to them on their quantum journeys and starting their quantum careers? Corey? That's so sweet. Um, I would say um, ask, I for me, I think the most helpful advice I've gotten working uh, in quantum computing um, especially without a background in it is, and I think this works even if you have a background in it, is ask a lot of dumb questions or like, well, I guess there is no dumb question, um, but even if you think it's dumb, someone else is probably confused if you're really confused. Um, and being uh, really um, vulnerable, I think in that way and um, putting yourself out there and being like, I don't know what this means, please tell me, um, is really the only way I think to fully understand this field because it's so complicated. Um, and I think if you do put yourself out there, most of the time people are really willing to um, explain things to you and that's kind of the only way to learn. Amazing. And everyone is already asking so many questions here. So this is already very good among our group and we encourage everyone to ask even more. And you see, we field advanced questions. We field more basic questions. Every question is worth to be asked. Monica, what is your advice for this whole enthusiastic group on their quantum journeys? Uh, I guess to be curious to follow whatever platform that you're passionate about. I think it really depends on personal preferences, but definitely be very curious and study really hard. <laughs> Asking questions, be curious work for it. Van Lin? Uh, my my uh, advice is like, uh, find your interests and then depending on your interests, find a mentor in the in the field which can guide you to the, the right direction. It's, like, it's also echo back what Corey and Monica say, ask a lot of questions and be curious. And then, yeah. So you need to find a topic there like in quantum, uh, the parts to make it work is a lot. So it's where it will be very overwhelming if you try to master all the aspects. So choose one part that you, you think that you'll be good and you are interested in. Fantastic. Corey, Monica, Van Lin, thank you so much for this great panel, for all your contributions from different sides to put threat icon computing into this perspective for all of us. Wish you a great day back to the lab or to the computer, to the quantum computer in this case, <laughs> we will move on with Stefano Passani about photonic quantum computing. Thank you very much. You are welcome to stay and hear about more about this other uh, physical implementation. And uh, let's be in touch. We will send some more questions from participants to you to answer later. Thank you. Thank you. Stefano, thank you very much for waiting. I hope you enjoyed the last part of the panel. I did, yeah, yeah. I was really enjoying it, yeah. Great. Very happy, happy having you. Stefano is a researcher at the Niels Bohr Institute at the University of Copenhagen. He is um, working on building towards photonic quantum computers. He has a PhD from the University of Bristol and studied in Rome. And now he is here with us today to give us an introductory lecture on photonic quantum computing. We have Stefano, we have already discussed superconducting quantum computers. We have discussed trapped ion quantum computers, neutral atom quantum computers. And this is now a new implementation for our whole group. Tomorrow, there will be a, 
a lab tour at Quick's Quantum in the Netherlands, showing a bit more what it actually looks like. And we hope that you can give us the foundation to understand everything in the lab tomorrow and see the benefits and future of photonic quantum computing. Please take it away. Sounds good. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here and to talk to you about photonic quantum computing. I hope I will cover most of the things <laughs> that you will see tomorrow in the lab. All right, so this is a rough uh, schematic of what I'm in I will be talking about. So I, I will start with the very basics on you know, what uh, photonic quantum computers are, what, what uh, quantum technology you can build on them. And then I will go a little bit more on the details of how we manipulate, uh, how we can manipulate those photonic qubits, how we can build the uh, hardware and circuit out of uh, some basic uh, components. And then uh, in the second part of the, of the lecture, I will go a bit more into the advanced topics of uh, how we actually build a, a, a photon and a quantum computing with photonics. So the, the end goal of this, of, this, uh, of, this, um, of this lecture is to give you a broad perspective of photonic quantum computing and eventually how, you know, give an idea of how a photonic quantum computer will look like. All right, so let's start with the very basics. So uh, as you know, photons are essentially single particles of light, okay? So uh, doing quantum, photonic quantum computing is essentially, you can think of it as doing quantum computation with, with light. So a little bit more in the details, uh, essentially if we have electromagnetic uh, or optical modes, a photon is a single excitation of those modes. And, uh, and, uh, and so encoding uh, quantum information using photons essentially corresponds to encoding the information on uh, which of the modes a photon is occupying, okay? So to do that, we need optical modes and uh, we have a, a choice over, money, over many possibilities. Uh, for example, we need to polarization or the temporal degree of freedom of the photon. But in this, uh, in this lecture, I will mostly focus on the path degree of freedom, okay? So we have, when we have two paths that the photon can travel through, and we will just define uh, a, a qubit to be in the zero mode if the photon is occupying the top mode, and the, and the qubit to be in the, in, the, in the one state if the photon is propagating through the bottom mode, okay? So we have this, uh, this mapping. So the encoding is done through the mapping of, uh, of the Fox state of the photon uh, to, the qubit, uh, to the logical state of the qubit. Okay, so the main properties of, uh, of, photo, of photons or of photonic qubits is that first of all, they are, fly, they are called, they are what is called flying qubits, meaning that if, you know, there is a, photons are not uh, static in a, in, a, in a chip or in a chamber or whatever, just, but just, and, you know. Uh, the, the, and Stefano, sorry. can you explain for the non-physicists what is a Fox state? Oh, sorry, yes. So a Fox state is a, is a um, is a state with a fixed number of excitations. Okay, so one photon is a Fox state, uh, you know, one photon, two photons, three photons are all Fox state of n photons, essentially. And, uh, and then you can also have like superposition states of different Fox states. And in fact, like a, a superposition of a Fox state of, of this Fox state and these Fox states will correspond to the superposition of the zero and one of your qubits. Right? <laughs> I hope, I hope that covers it. Um, okay, so, so, so yeah, so photons are fine qubits, so they, they, they propagate, they don't stay still. And another problem is that we don't have interaction between photons. So photons are uh, particles that don't interact with, between each other. So what, uh, what uh, you know, these two, these two main properties uh, bring, uh, you know, possibilities and challenges for this platform. The positives are that, uh, uh, you know, the lack of interaction between photons means that there is very, essentially, there is very low de de coherence. So essentially, the coherence is not relevant for photonic qubits. They don't, they don't decohere. And also, we can uh, transmit them uh, over very long distances. For example, we can just put photons into optical fibers and transmit them through, you know, kilometers of distances. But then the problem is that, uh, you know, this lack of interaction, as we will see later on, means that uh, it's very difficult to perform two qubit gates, or two qubit operation, and we will see how you know, the lack of interaction means that we need, intrinsically need to do them probabilistically. And then, and then another problem of having photons propagating through, lo through, long, distance, through long distances is that uh, they can be lost. So, for example, they can be absorbed by a medium and we have no way of correcting the loss of a photon. So that loss, you know, a, a lost photon is, is gone and we cannot retrieve it in the information. Okay, but anyway, so, so, so these are the properties. 
Um, in general, uh, this very long link transmission and high coherence is very, is very good for, uh, for, uh, for a number of technologies, for example, for quantum communication and quantum networks. But we also, we, there are also a number of uh, companies that are building, uh, that are heavily based on photonics to build, for example, quantum sensors and quantum sensors and quantum processors. So in this talk, I will mostly be focusing on, on quantum processors. So let's see, let's see how we can actually, you know, process the quantum, the quantum information encoded in, into photons. So let's start with the simple bits, so one qubit gates. And, uh, and so in photonics, uh, to make a, to make a, a gates, so we have two main building blocks. One is the bin splitter, but essentially it just is a, it's a semi-reflective mirror where uh, if you just enter in, with one photo in, uh, in, in a mode, then it splits it uh, with 50% chance to be, you know, in, in the, here for example, in the, top, in, the, in the top mode or the bottom mode, okay? So essentially this, corres this corresponds to getting a, 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 a superposition between the optical modes. And in fact, the, the typical uh, unitary transformation of the bin splitter is like this one, which is essentially a, is, is, is similar to an Adamar transformation. The second building block uh, is, uh, is the phase shifter, which simply adds an optical phase uh, to one, to, to one optical mode respect to the other. And this corresponds to a, to a unity transformation that is the, just a rotation along the Z axis of the, of the block sphere. And then the idea is just to combine these two operations together. For example, we can sandwich a phase shifter between two these splitters to create the so-called Mach-Zeta interferometers. And now the operation that uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, this network of, uh, of components is doing on the, on the photon, on the photonic qubit, is a rotation along the y axis of the block sphere. Okay, so, so combining them, we can rotate the angle of the rotation. We, we can change the direction and the angle of the rotation. But then again, so if we just, if we just uh, put two phase shifters uh, um, around the Mach Zender, we obtain a, a sequence of a Z rotation and a Y rotation in between them. And this essentially corresponds to a, the Euler decomposition of a, of a, of a unitary on a cube of a qubit unitary. So essentially changing these three phases, we can implement an arbitrary rotation in the block sphere. So an arbitrary single qubit gate. And uh, so in practice, this, this can also be done with very high precision. So in fact, in photonics, we reached the uh, infidelities of 10 to the minus seven for these single qubit gates. Uh, so roughly speaking, this, that's an error uh, every, you know, every 10 millions of these gates, so it's very low. Uh, and this has been, you know, with the state of the art, uh, with state of the art hardware, this is almost, uh, you know, routinely ob obtained in the in the labs nowadays. So let's see quickly, you know, what what the state of the art hardware looks like. So as I mentioned, we have two main uh, building blocks for uh, for photonic quantum computer: uh, the bin splitter and the phase shifter. Now, how you implement this depends on how you encode your qubits or what what modes you use. So for example, in polarization, uh, we have the wave plates, just uh, 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 thin films of, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with birefringence, like birefringent thin films that do, that do different operations on the, on the different polarizations. And you're just rotating these wave plates, you can, you know, they, they have the role of, of implementing these bisplitters and phase shifters. But now for path qubits, uh, uh, it also depends on how you, you know, on, 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 the, on the photonic platform that you are using to implement this case. So we, for example, we can use this bulk uh, bit splitters, so just pieces, big pieces of glasses uh, of the size of some centimeters, but then you can also start integrating it into fibers and even more using integrated photonics. So we can integrate it in single components of the size of microns. And this is the most scalable platform that is being developed uh, uh, these days, uh, and in fact, tomorrow you will you will uh, you will uh, probably see a lab focused on this on this uh, on this platform. So let's see how you can implement them. So for the bin splitter, they implement, for example, using these directional couplers, where the idea is that we have these two. You can see these two optical wave guides. So photons. Pro these are the two optical modes that we use to encode the photon. Okay, so uh, the photonic qubit. So the photon arriving here means that it's in the zero state. Uh, a photon arriving here. It's in a one state, and then we have superposition of the two. And to do the bin splitter, what we do is to bring these two wave gas very close together, such that to the, in this region here, the coupling region, they get coupled together. And if you 
and if you engineer the coupling length properly, you will end up with a 50% chance of the photon tunneling from one waveguide to the other. Okay, so in the end, it acts essentially as a semi-reflective mirror between uh, these two pairs of waveguides. And that's our big splitter. And as you see, now these integrated photonics, these elements can be, can be fabricated the size of uh, order tens of micrometers, so very small. The other elements that we need are the phase shifters. And one possible way to, to implement them is using these uh, on-chip thermal phase shifters. Where, uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, the cross section of this wave. So imagine just uh, cutting uh, inside, inside the, the, the screen, uh, this, uh, this chip uh, in half, and just looking at the cross section of that. Okay, so we have our wave get here. And then what we do, it's represented here, what we do is to put a, a resistance on top of the waveguide and put a voltage to which such that it dissipates thermal, it dissipate power thermally into the, into, the, into the substrate and heats up the waveguide. Now, when the waveguide heats up, it changes the refractive index. And so changing the refractive index means that the light propagates a little bit slowly. And so effectively, you're adding a phase to the light propagating through this mode. Okay, so actually controlling the voltage that you apply here, you control the temperature that you that you have on the waveguide, and you control the phase. So this and, is this is how we sorry. And Stefano, uh, David from US asks, how are the path qubits and wavelet qubits related to Fox states when you were at the directional couplers? Right. So the the so we have a Fox state of a single photon arriving from here. So we have a Fox state of uh, one zero essentially that corresponds to the log to the state uh, zero of your qubit. He said if you have a, a Fox state zero one, meaning just a single photon arriving from the bottom and vacuum on top, that corresponds to your to your qubit uh, in the in the state one. Okay, so those are, are the kind of the computational basis. Uh, uh, I'm defining the, the, the photon, so the, the Fox state corresponds to the computational basis of our qubit, and then just a uh, superposition of uh, 0, 1, and, uh, and 1, 0 corresponds to a superposition state of, the, of your qubit. OK, so okay. essentially, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, so, so having the photon uh, tunnel between the two, the two, the two waveguides in this region here corresponds to effectively mixing the two, uh, mixing the two Fox states, and, that, and, that, and that's what generates the superposition, right? So essentially, this, this splitter is, uh, if you start from a Fox state, it generates the superposition state. In the and then Mostafa from Iran asks, can you explain in detail how we create phase in one qubit by the phase shifter device? Right. So again, our qubit uh, is, uh, if the photon is propagating here, is in the state zero. If the photon is propagating here, it's in the state one. So what we're doing by adding a phase here is effectively changing the phase only of the one of the one state and not of relative to the zero state. So this one uh, effectively performs this operation here. Great. I think this clarifies it. Please go ahead. Okay. So. The next thing about different photonics is that once we know how to build these, uh, these building blocks, then, uh, then we can just uh, build the networks of them to make a larger and larger computations. So this is, uh, this is how the field of integrated photonics uh, developed in the last year. You can see that, uh, in fact, the total number of components on the circuits increased exponentially, where like 10 years ago, we were using these chips with around 10 components. Then we went to 30 components. And then now we have the point where we can have hundreds or thousands of components into single chips. And you can see how also the number of qubits and the photons that we can control with these qubits, with these, uh, with these processors went up. And in fact, so this is, uh, this is uh, how the hardware is developing. The, the, so actually how the circuits are developing. And, and another important point is that, so each of these, uh, each of these circuits corresponds actually to a unitary transformation. So this, this would be a unitary over, uh, in this case, 32 modes. And, and so this one is particularly a single unitary, but we also have schemes to perform uh, arbitrary unitaries. So uh, these are called universal quantum photonic circuits. So an example is this uh, triangular structure of uh, Maxander interferometers. So again, this is just a structure of uh, a, a network of many of those directional curves and phase shifters. And Rack and others have shown uh, that uh, essentially just this scheme, you can implement arbitrary 
unitaries over M modes. And this has also been implemented recently in a lab uh, using integrated photonics for a six mode uh, for a six mode interferometer. So this interferometer is, is, is basically able to implement arbitrary optical uh, operations on six modes. And tomorrow, I think you will see also larger versions of these ones with uh, more modes, up to twelve modes, I think. Okay, so this is how. So essentially, using this structure, we can implement. Uh, we can just see circuits as uh, a big black box that performs a unitary U that we can tune arbitrarily. And then the other key components that we need, of course, are uh, photon sources. So we want to know how to generate the single photons, and then photon detectors. So it allows us to that allows us to measure our photons or our qubits at the end of the after the circuit. Okay, so let's see briefly how do how these two other components work. The first uh, the first one is photon sources, and there are two two approaches in general to to mixing of photon sources. One is based on uh, spontaneous nonlinear photon sources that uses nonlinear effects such as, uh, for example, spontaneous paramedic conversion or spontaneous Fourier mix are called. Where the the basic idea is that if we send a, a bright uh, laser into an into a into a nonlinear uh, material, then with certain probability, part of this laser gets annihilated to generate uh, pairs of uh, single photons. Okay, so essentially you can see this as a bright laser coming in, uh, and with some probability this emits uh, a pair of photons at the output. But the problem with this is that uh, being a spontaneous process is uh, is probabilistic. So we, not always we generate pairs of photons here, but in general this probability is typically around one percent uh, or, or order a few percent. So another approach that's being uh, that is gaining momentum in the in the, in recent years is instead using deterministic quantum emitters to generate single photons. And uh, these systems are, for example, uh, for example, quantum dots. We can just think of them as uh, uh, two-level systems that are that are optically coupled very well into into a single optical mode, and such that if you excite them, then they decay, emitting a single photon into the optical mode they are coupled to. And there are different ways to make them. So, for example, is to you know there's different ways to build up this uh, this coupling to optical mode. So one of them is using this. Uh, cylindrical cavities, macro pillars. And another one is to embed these photons into, so, so, th so this is kind of bulk approach. And this is a, it's an integrated approach where we embed these quantum dots into planar nanostructures on chips. Uh, these are called the crystal, uh, photonic crystals, uh, such that the photons are, are that, that the quantum dots are coupled just with the single quantum mode that uh, this photonic crystal propagate. And, and then you can see, so we excite these quantum dots in here and it generates single photons and we can get Collect and 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 use. Another important strength of this uh, of this uh, of these quantum emitters is that they can also generate photons, not only just single photons, but photons directly, like photonic qubits directly entangled. And to do this, we also need to use a spin degree of freedom uh, inside this quantum dot. But in general, the the the, ref, the 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 idea is just that if you tune, uh, if you have a spin and you tune uh, this uh, this um, exciting uh, uh, the pulses. Then you can arbitrarily tune uh, entanglement between the emitted photons. So, and so, so with this platform, we, get, we are able to generate small uh, kind of modular states of entangled photons, and this will turn off will turn out very useful later on in the, when we want to build uh, uh, photon quantum computers. Okay, then the other the other bit that we care about is photon photon detectors, and the state of the art on this uh, on this is um, is uh, so called the superconducting nanowire single photon detectors. So the way there was, this is a picture from from NIST, which is one of the main players in manufacturing these systems, and uh, and the the rough idea of this uh, of these detectors is that we have uh, is to have a, a a wire of superconducting material that uh, you know and, and you monitor the current that is uh, that is uh, traveling through this material. Now, if there is uh, if the if, if the material is superconducting, there is no resistance here. But what happens is that when when a photon arrives. Then it can get absorbed by by this uh, by this uh, superconducting nanowire and dissipates power into the nanowire. Now, what this power does is to break uh, it, it breaks essentially Cooper pairs in the in the superconducting material, uh, and essentially what it does is to break the superconductivity for a very for a very short period of time, 
And so it, for, for a very short period of time, you don't have superconductivity anymore. So you, and so you would see a difference in the voltage that is being, uh, or in the current that is being uh, propagating through the, through the material. So just looking at these very uh, quick um, electronic signals, uh, you know, we, we, we understand if a photon has been uh, detected or not. Okay, so that's the very, that's the background on the, on the hardware. Uh, so now essentially what, you know, we, we, know, we know how to generate single photons. We know how, you know how to process them, you know, how, how to build interferometers to process them. And we know how to detect them. So essentially the, the you know, the most uh, basic uh, scheme of a linear optical, of a photonic processor is just a scheme like this, where you just have an input state of n photons into n different uh, input modes some tunable interferometers and then, and then some detectors. Now, an important result for, uh, for uh, photonic quantum computing was this one from Aronson and Arcupo. That's essentially demonstrated that even in this very basic uh, scenario, uh, uh, simulating this, uh, this experiment uh, is exponentially hard uh, on a classical computer. When it's that, you, know, you can directly implement it in a lab. So more in detail, they define the so-called the boson sampling problem, which is exactly, you know, you, you prepare, you prepare uh, end state photons, you propagate them through an interferometer, and then you sample from the output distribution. So you just detect the output state in multiple rounds of the experiment. And what they show is that if U is random, is hard random, then essentially uh, classically simulating boson sampling is exponentially, is exponentially hard, even in the approximate case. So even if you have, uh, uh, you know, imperfections in your experiments to some degree, classically simulating it is still, uh, is still exponentially hard. So of course, this is a very, it, it, it was a very important result for quantum photonics because it showed a near term way to test, you know, quantum advantages for photonics, uh, for photonic systems with respect to, to, uh, to classical computers. But, uh, but it has the problem that it's not solving any particularly interesting uh, computation problem. In fact, it's, it's, even difficult to, it's even difficult to define it as a computation because here I'm not defining any, there's no notion of uh, you know, two qubit gates or, or you know, any digital notion of gates at all here. Here, we're just talking about photons in, interfering inside the in, a interferometer and then detecting the output. And so the, 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 you know, the, the nice point of this is just that the, it's kind of an analog machine which can prove uh, quantum advantage very easily on, uh, on near-term on near devices, on these NISC photonic devices, but there is no, no clear application for them. And um, in, in the, after, the, after the break, we will see how instead uh, we can use this type of circuits to implement two qubit gates. So, but still, uh, boson sampling was, was, was interesting for the community uh, to demonstrate quantum advantages. And this is exactly what happened in the last uh, couple of years. Where, for, where uh, first at the, at the UC, UCTC in, uh, in, um, in China, where they demonstrated a boson sampling experiment in 76 photons in 100 modes and 113 photons in, in uh, 144 modes a, a year later. And then also very recently, Xanadu, a company in Toronto, demonstrated the version of boson sampling with 219 photons in 216 modes. And they claim uh, computational speed ups that are not marginal, but you know, uh, 10 to the 14 times faster than current best classical supercomputers. So it's really big quantum advantage being obtained with this, these devices. Uh, interesting, the Xanadu, the Xanadu experiment is also accessible if you're interested on, uh, on, online on the cloud of the Amazon bracket. Okay, so, so yeah, so we, we, get, we get with photonics, uh, we get these uh, huge speed ups, but again, uh, it's not really, it's not solving any interesting computation. So yeah, so after the break, we, so now we have seen uh, how we make, uh, how we define photonic qubits, how we define photon and photonic qubits, how we can make uh, single qubit operations of them and make uh, larger circuits to make uh, larger interferometers and show uh, first quantum advantages. Now, after the talk, we will take a bit more uh, advanced stance on it and look at how we can implement two qubit gates and, and move towards photon and quantum computation. Great to so have you. Yep. Very insightful. Will you be available during the break for some questions? Yes. yes or, okay. Then could you go to the slide with the gates? Uh, or let's say the phase shifts. Arkan Hassan uh, from the University of Arkansas asks, how close can you get to the pi phase shift? And very much related, Key asks, how much degree can you shift 
how many degrees can you shift by the thermal phase shifter? Is there any limitation? Right. Yeah. This is a, this is a good, a good question, of course. Um, so so the essentially the main the limitation depends on the particular implementation of your phase shifter. But for this thermal phase shifter, for example, the main limitation to get uh, to um, for for the infidelities is that. Uh, First, so you have finite resolution on your voltage, for example. So it's very difficult. So the the, the, the main the main limitation is in the, on the voltage that you apply to these phase shifters to get uh, to the to the um, to the desired phase. But typically, you can have twelve digits of precision there, and then that, that's what brings to this uh, ten to the minus seven uh, infidelities. Um, so the second part of the question was on. <laughs> Yeah, how, how far can you really get the phase shift? Yeah. Can you get oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Five? So this, this is, yeah, yeah, typically with these phase shifters, it depends on the material, but typically you need a uh, uh, few volts, so uh, up to 10 volts, I would say, to, to get to pi phase shifts. So there, there are no big limitations in that, I would say. And this For this particular implementation. Abdelis or uh, Sharma's question, who asked, can you tune it externally? Yes, with the voltage. Then Abdella from Algeria asks, how are two qubit gates generated in photonic quantum computers? <laughs> that we will see later the break. Uh, hold okay. on. It's because <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, I mean, the spoiler is, is very different with, you know, by, with, with making single qubit gates. <laughs> this is also interesting. We are used from the companies the past days and weeks to talk about uh, fidelities and you talk about infidelities. <laughs> Right, yeah, yeah, sure. Which sure. is, yeah, from the ac academic point of view, also a very clear indicator. Many of the other questions can be saved for after the break. And we are soon at the end of the break already. Will you talk about lattice percolation too, Stefano? Yes, I will. Okay. I mean, yes, not, then, not, not too much, not too much into details, but uh, I will try. Yeah. Then always can have some patience. Great. Why did you choose this uh, focus of research yourself, Stefano? Me? I, well, I liked it. As I, I start, when I started my... I was kind of an hybrid. At the, so I decided I was a theorist. And then I, I, during my, I decided to go to do a master in, into, <laughs> into this because I just, wanted to, I just wanted to have a simple system that allows you to test uh, quantum mechanics uh, and uh, you know as a even as a as a young as a young researcher and photons are really a com very convenient system to do that you know that for the reason we just saw that it's very easy to encode single qubits and do single qubit operations then then uh, you know i got hooked to it and i like it and let's wait briefly everyone can drink some water and continue with the next part of the lecture I'll go get a quick glass of water as well, if that's okay. See Bill. you back soon. In the meantime, are there any speakers that you really want to have in the program still? We have had many great speakers from IBM, Continuum, a panel on the careers, a great keynote by Worley. We had Denise Ruffner, we had William Oliver. Are there any speakers that you dream of having next week or the next month? Put your input in the chat. People from Los Alamos, great idea. And they also have some great quantum computing internships and summer course. Are you there yourself, Louise? Several people are typing. Any speaker for continuous variable QC? Some talks on quantum materials. Yes, I agree, Ashley. Uh, this is also something close to my heart. I uh, work on it myself. Ah, should I go over my work? Of course, I can do that if you want. <laughs> Actually, I do really interesting work. Uh, we have been talking a lot about quantum simulators, right? And 
what I work on is analog quantum simulators where I put atoms one by one in a scanning tunneling microscope in the specific spot that we want. So we have been talking with, uh, about uh, the optical tweezers, for example, right? That you can uh, create your potential wells a few micrometers away from each other. I can put the atoms with atomic precision, which is uh, a few angstroms next to each other and create a lattice that we are interested in and then measure its properties. So be glad to, uh, to talk about that too. Antonio would like to have young guts or Miko Matonen from IQM. Well, then I have good news for you. Uh, young guts will be there in August in the entrepreneur and founder panel. So he will be there and you can ask all your questions to him. IQM will also be there August 1st. So that is already next week, Monday at the career fair. And there is a really interesting hackathon problem posed by them with uh, three mentors from IQM. Zapata will also be there during the entrepreneur and founder panel and they will be at the career fair. Polaris QB will also be back at the career fair. Uh, you can interact with them there. <laughs> Sharma wants me to give a talk. All right, I will go for it. More talks about quantum sensing and quantum networking. This is also great input. Um, we have our quantum summer now. We have been talking about quantum winter starting, right? We would like to take that a bit of a different turn and organize more seminars, some other quantum series on different topics. So your suggestions about quantum sensing, quantum networking is also very good. And we would like to have all your input for topics that you want to see in our next program. Technical University Delft, of course. Um, we have many contacts there and we could still arrange some to have them either the next weeks or in future series. Andrew from Strangeworks, he will be involved in the hackathon challenge from Strangeworks, which will start in two weeks. A very interesting challenge too. So you can interact with him directly. He was one of the persons who posed that challenge. Contralogs or any company manipulating qubits with machine learning, very interesting. We can uh, start some more advanced series, more workshops about quantum programming and coding, QML. We have also been uh, discussing that. I think it is a very good suggestion for uh, the next level of this. All right, feel free to keep going. I see, Stefano, you are also ready. So. Yes, write down your thoughts. Uh, the chat will be open afterwards to give more suggestions. And right now we get back to photonic quantum computing. Take it away for the second part, Stefano. Yeah. So where were we? Here we are. All right, so, so let's go forward with this uh, two qubit operation and, and photonic quantum computing. Okay, so this is the this is where things get hard. Okay, because the, as I said at the start, so the um, one of the advantages, but also one of the disadvantages of photons is that they don't interact. So this saves us uh, the coherence, saves us from the coherence. And of course, poses the key question of you know if they don't interact, how can we entangle them? So uh, one one important difference is that photons uh, interfere. But don't, but, but don't interact. So there is subtle but uh, important difference between the two, and we, we will see in a second. Okay, so how, how can we entangle them? And the, the answer is one of the answers is, is measurements, also called the measurement based interactions. So we're going to see in a second how, they, how, we can, how we can kind of implement interactions with uh, true measurements. But the general idea of it is that, uh, first of all, uh, you know, it's it's uh, if you just need to make measurements, you just you know, linear optical interferometers and measurement, then it's easy to it's easy to to do, right? We saw we saw before we can make interferometers. We know how to make how to measure photons, and we know how to do it precisely. So that's that's uh, that's great. But uh, but the problem is that uh, you know that's not the end of the story. The problem is that uh, measurements are probabilistic, and so this will intrinsically add a probabilistic process into our into our system. And so, and so the question is, can we still do full tolerant quantum computation if we introduce probabilistic, uh, probabilistic process? Let's see, we will see more about it later on. Okay, so let's see, let's see a very simple example of how, 
how measurements do make interactions. Okay. Okay, and the very simple example I'm going to show is this uh, so-called Bernstein generator. What the idea is that we start with this with, with two separable photons, so photons favored in, in plus and plus. As I said before, so we, we just make plus by starting it with the photon in the top mode, for example, here, so starting the qubit in zero, and then you make a bit splitter, you get plus, you get a superposition. So we start with these two, and then we just use this circuit. Uh, now, this component here is just a crosser, so just you know, it just you, you cross the two the two wave gas and the, the two wave gas don't talk between each other. And then finally, we will make a measurement. So this, this is called a, a coincidence measurement. Essentially, you can think about it as a as a as a projective measurement in, into the subspace where there is just one photon on top and one photon on bottom. On the bottom, on the bottom two modes. Okay. So we only we only keep the detection events where there is a, a single photon on these two modes. So we don't care about which two of these modes the photon occupies, but just we care, we care just a single photon here and a single photon here. And all the other events, for example, where two photons are here, we discard them. So we just project into the into the subspace where there is one photon here and one photon here. Okay, so let's see what we get. So we start, uh, we start, uh, so again, I'm gonna try to do it as detailed as possible. So we label the four modes A, B, C, and D. And so, and, and we map these box states of having a single photon in the top mode to the state zero of the first qubit, second mode to the state one of the first qubit, for the third mode to the state one of the second qubit, and the photon in mode B to the zero of the second qubit. Okay. And so we start from plus plus. And so we, we just, you know, we get zero plus one, and zero plus one on both qubits, and we write them into their Fox states. And so in, in, in the Foxes, we just obtain these uh, four two photons terms. So two photons, so this represents the creation of a photon here. This represents the case where there is one photon here, 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 and one photon here, one photon here. Four cases. Great. Now we swap. Uh, now we do the swap. So we swap modes B and C to this swap. And so what happens is that the four modes are just you know AD. They don't get any swap, so they stays there. A and C, we, we swap C with B, we get a, an AB term. Again, in this case, uh, B goes to C. And, and now we in the first case, in the fourth case, we get uh, both B and C swap. So in the end, we just remain with the same state. OK, so that's the state uh, that we obtain here. OK, but now we perform this measurement. So again, remember, we, we are going to project into the, that's the subspace where there is just one photon here and one photon here. So which of these four terms uh, satisfy this, uh, this condition? So the first one, we get one photon here, one photon here. Great, this case. The second case, uh, now we have both photons in the top mode and nothing in the bottom. So in this case, uh, it's not in the subspace we're measuring. So this one will, will be discarded. So essentially, we, we, we said it is post-selected out in this case. In the sense that we, when we detect, we are not, never going to see this case. OK, then. Uh, Similar for this one, now we have both photons at the bottom instead of the top. Uh, but again, both two photons here, no photons here. We discard this one. And the last one, uh, both photons get swapped. So again, we get a, a, just for a single photon on the top two modes, a single photon on the top two modes. Great, we accept it. And now if we just rewrite this state into the into the qubit, uh, uh, into the qubit basis, this just corresponds, you know, we have a photon here, the photon here corresponds to the term 0, 0. Then a photon in B, a photon in C corresponds to term one one, and you obtain a bell state. Okay, so we started from a, a we started from a, you know a separable state to end up with a bell state. So we could get it entirely. Now there are two there are two things here, right? So first one is that this state is not normalized. So if you if you take the if you take the it's normal, it's a one over two. And this indicates essentially the this process, essentially, the, 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 the projection happens only half of the time. That's essentially the, this gate access with, uh, uh, happens with the probability 0 0.5. Essentially, it means that uh, out of four states, uh, we started with a uniform superposition out of four states, uh, we delete two of them, uh, so 50% of the cases are going to be discarded. So you see that now the entanglement, gate, the, the entanglement exists, uh, but it's probabilistic. Half of the time, we will get uh, no outcome at all. The second point uh, is that uh, here the entanglement is generated only like, by the measurement. So we generate entanglement only when the photons are measured, so only when the photons are destroyed. Okay. 
So, it's, so you know, the, the, an obvious question is, uh, okay, if we generate entanglement between something that just destroyed, how, you know, is it, is it, is it useful at all? Uh, the is yes. In fact, just, just me. So the answer is yes, but to do so, you need to see, instead of sending a single photon, send the output, you need to send the photons that are part of the entangled state. Could you repeat how you went from step two to three, Buttercutter asks? Two, why, two, are, why are the red ones gone? Right, so we are, again, so we are doing this coincidence measurement, okay? This measurement is essentially only, only uh, you know, you, you only get an event of this measurement if a photon is on these top two modes and a photon is on, the, on, on these bottom two modes. So you don't care if the photon, you know, if, if the photon on the top two modes is here or here, but you just care that it's in between one of these two modes. The same for the bottom. So if you do that, so we, we, are, we are projecting to this subspace, okay? Now, if you look at these four terms, A, D, A, B, C, D, C, B, C, B, now, A, B is the, care, is the case where we have both photons here and no photons here, you see? So this case doesn't satisfy, you know, it's not in the subspace that we are projecting into. And what it means is that we are not going to get an event from our measurement, okay? Essentially, we get no, no click, if you want, from our measurement. Uh, see, same for this one, both of them are the bottom. So for these two cases, we're, not, we're never gonna detect them essentially. They're post-selected out, that's what it is. It's, it's and Siddharth asks, how is that kind of measurement exactly done that they are in both? Right, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an end function. So we, we have detectors here and, we, and we're doing an end. So we're only gonna spit out an event if, uh, so, we're gonna do an or between these two, if you want, an or between these two, and then an end between the this, the outputs of these two. So we're we're only gonna get an outcome if we if both uh, if both a photon here is detected and a photon here is detected. So essentially, it's just a you know a, an end implemented electronically. Great. Or on top, for All right. So again, so the, the so so. What happens now if instead of so here we kind of generate uh, entanglement but immediately destroy it? Okay, so we generate entanglement only by destroying it. And now let's see what happens if instead these photons are part of an entangled state. Oh, there is a manner detail, I mean, not very manner, but uh, they are put, I, I put also two bin splitters here. Ah, there was one thing that I wanted to mention here. The notice that there is no interference here in principle. Okay, I'm, 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 just, I'm just saying that uh, we are doing a measurement here. So this is really. We're not generating entanglement by interfering for them in some fancy way. It's literally just the measurements it makes it back. Here instead for some uh, for some um, for some details reasons, I also need to put bin splitters. So here we also have interference. But uh, so the, the the description will slightly change, but I uh, assure you it's, it's kind of the same. So now we we start with qubits that are uh, part of a larger entanglement. So I'm just gonna use this notation here where we have these graphs, where each of these nodes is a, is a qubit and edges between the qubits indicate uh, entanglement within them. Okay, so this one here is, a, we start with the five qubit uh, uh, entangled state uh, and similar here. Okay, so now these of these qubits uh, go through this circuit. And what happens is that uh, the effect of this measurement now is that uh, uh, these two qubits get destroyed, gets measured. But now with probability p 0 0.5. So if, so if the measurement is successful, then the, the two graph state here, the two states here gets fused together. Okay, so we start from two small graph, from two small uh, entangled state, and through this measurement, we're building a larger entanglement. And the problem is that, of course, we also with half our probability, we don't do anything. So we just, we just the measurement fails. So we don't, we don't detect anything. And effectively, what it does is to, um, so don't 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 fuse the two. So just the two forms are left. Okay. So now, so this is this is called the fusion gate now. So it's just a, a gate that is used to fuse entanglement resources into larger entangled states. Uh, an important point is this one is that uh, if it, if the gate fails, we know about it. 
Okay, simply because uh, if they get fixed, uh, we don't get uh, we don't get an outcome out of this uh, detection event, and so we know that they are they, 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 that we got this state instead of this one. So we know whenever it fails, uh, it's probabilistic, but whenever it fails, we know that it fails. Okay, this, this is going to be important for you. Um, okay, so this is literally all the all the <laughs> the ingredients we need. So again, just to just to just to just to recap so we want uh, so the, the ingredient is uh, we want to start from small entangled states uh, and i mentioned so the the one way of possibly getting it is through this quantum emitters that directly directly emit uh, um, entangled, you know, small entangled states of of, uh, of photon qubits and then other possible ways to start just with uh, uh, single photons that are not entangled and then use a seat with something like this to generate entangled states so in this case uh, is a G and Z state of, of, of three, three qubits. So we start with these smaller entangled states. And then the idea is to use fusion gates to, to fuse more and more of these, uh, many copies of these uh, small resources into larger and larger entangled states. Okay. So that's the basic idea of, uh, of, uh, of uh, funny quantum computing. Now, so, so let's see what happens. So we start with the single photons. Now the idea is that we entangle them, okay? And then in the end, we just measure, measure the output of the forms of computation. Now, the, the problem that I, saw, that I said before is that uh, this, um, this, uh, this entangling gate are not deterministic, but, but are probabilistic. So, oh, so effectively, what happens is that uh, not all of those links are going to be generated. Another reason, another, uh, uh, reason why these links or these qubits uh, might not exist is also because qubits uh, can be lost, which, as I said before, is a, is a, you know, is a, is, is a relevant error for photonics. So, so we essentially we want to we want to start we want to build this cluster here, this like a large entangled state, but not of all the links exist, but and not all of the qubits exist. But importantly, we know where they are uh, where they are uh, lost. So the idea is that if the if the density of the link is high enough, then we can find kind of a path that percolates through this uh, through this lattice, and, and in this path, you know, this path corresponds to long range entanglement between all of these qubits. Okay, and and really, really like this many body entanglement is literally the is, is, is the real resource that, that one needs for for quantum computation. So the you know if we manage to build up this long range entanglement, that could be used for quantum computation. So literally here, so what, what we're using is the concept of percolation. Okay, so we, 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 if, the, if, the, if the density of remaining links and qubits is high enough, the idea is that we can percolate, we can find a path that percolates through the lattice and that this percolation corresponds to having a large range entanglement through the, through the you know, of, 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 of photonic qubits. So here the concept, the relevant of this is percolation, right? If we are, uh, if we are below the percolation threshold, well, the one. Okay. If, if, if the losses and the probabilities are below, and the failure probabilities are below the percolation threshold, then with very high probability, we will always have long range entanglement of the running qubits, even, even if uh, you know, the, the, the processes are probabilistic and, and we have lost. So that's, you know, this, is, this is how we, in photonics, we think about correcting uh, um, how to make probabilistic. Uh, probabilistic two photon gates, you know, deterministic uh, uh, entanglement generation, long range entanglement generation. Okay, but here is, a, this is a single, uh, you know, it's, a, it's essentially a chain, essentially a chain. So if we want to just sing, it's a, a 1D entanglement. If we want to make 2D entanglement, we need to make a, a three, we need to go into three dimensions where one of the dimensions corresponds to essentially time. And the other two dimensions correspond to the 2D um, to the structure of of of, of, uh, of qubits, of, 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 of uh, physical qubits, if you want. An idea is similar as this. So we start, uh, for example, with three qubit uh, resource states. So these are G and Z states, and we fuse many of them to create a, a lattice. That if the if the if the uh, the density of the links is good enough, then we manage to percolate through this one and perform computation out of this uh, out of this long range time. So that's literally the, the idea of, uh, of a photonic quantum computer. This is what it will look like. So we start from small entangled resource states, 
then you do fusions to fuse them together. And then you kind of percolate through a, to, you find a percolated path through a lattice uh, to, to generate a long region time. And, th and then we have all these classical control that tells us, uh, you know, based on what uh, links are made, uh, how we should measure the qubits that are, that are left in order to perform the correct computation. This is called the measurement based quantum computation. I'm not going to talk about it. Okay, so you can also think about it as uh, so essentially what happens is that we have a state that uh, as, we, as, we, as we consume the state to perform computation, we are generating more and more uh, entanglement out of it. So this is effectively what's going to happen. That, uh, we generate, uh, we generate uh, a lattice uh, which has more and more photons generated from the single photon sources. We find, we, we, we have a constant uh, sized uh, lattice existing to find the percolated path through it. And then in the end, we're just gonna measure the, the you know, based on the percolated lattices, we're gonna measure a pattern that perform computation on this, on this long range of time. Okay, so this, I, I hope this gives you <laughs> a rough idea of what uh, was the game. And yeah, so this is this concludes, uh, concludes my talk. So as I told you, so we started from the very basic qubit, single qubit operations. Then we saw the challenge of, of the qubit operation, how you can do them probabilistically. And then we, and then we saw how percolation essentially allows you to perform computation, even you know, deterministic computation, even if the presence of uh, probabil probabilistic operations. Okay, so with this, I would like to conclude and I'm open to the questions. Amazing. Thank you very much for this fantastic lecture, Stefano. Really insightful. And there are more questions to really understand the technologies. I would like to go through a few sources of error with you. You mentioned losses. It just means photons get absorbed. Could you, could you tell more about that as a source of error? That's right. So, so, so photons are kind of unique on this in the sense that, uh, as I saw, as, as, as I told you, the circuits themselves, had, the photonic circuits themselves, had in principle very low errors, uh, but not, but but loss. So especially gate errors uh, can be made quite small, but the loss is the main, is the dominant source of errors for these qubits. So literally, it's, 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 it's you know, loss is, is is really a qubit disappears, and you can and, and you can do anything about it. So it's it's um. It's a, it's a quite particular type of, of error. The good thing about losses is that uh, they're, they're very easy to detect because you just send the photon, you just send what you think is a photon to a detection, to detector. And if you, if the detector clicks, it means that the photon exists, otherwise it doesn't exist. Otherwise you detect that the losses happen, right? And this has, uh, has, um, has you know, various consequences for photon photo computing. In particular, the, the thresholds for losses are very high with respect to gate error. Um, Related to Bakao's question, what is the percentage of photons that are eventually useful for the computation? How much do you lose? Right. So the um, how much do we lose? So okay, that depends on that depends on the architecture. So current fault tolerance schemes again accept losses up to uh, ten percent, for example. So meaning that. Uh, 90% of, it's enough that 90% of your photon survive to perform loss tolerant photon computation. We are still not yet experimental. Experimentally, typically, uh, you know, if we get if we get 50% uh, uh, transmission, uh, we are extremely happy. <laughs> so we need so we need to get to 90%, and you know, getting from 50% to 90% is extremely hard. Um, but but you still, you know, it's not it's not uh, it's not uh, one per million. It's really you know. 10% of them even still lose, which is still good. Oh. Then you had this layer device. How is the precision to for the nanofabrication there? Is that also a source of, of error in the in the devices? Uh, yes, there is so um, there is so there are there are uh, so there, there is but there are multiple ways to mitigate it. So you know. Of course, a, 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 a straightforward way of mitigating it is to get better fabrication. <laughs> better fabric. But this is so. This is uh, this is um, you know in photonics. So there is there is uh, in photonics we use silicon photonics. Uh, so silicon silicon is one of the main platforms that's being pursued, for example, by Psi Quantum, this big company on photonic photocomputing. And it's advantage that uh, 
silicon silicon photonics has been used for a lot of applications on uh, on um, for classical applications for, you know, all of us have it as it in, in wi-fi if you use optical fibers like a silicon photonic transistor uh, transceiver and and uh, and the uh, uh, so 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 there has been a lot of engineering on optimizing all of these components so those can be made very precise and then even if we get the small uh, small errors in the in the fabricated components there are ways to to mitigate them so for example uh, this 10 to the minus this 10 to the minus 6 was obtained by essentially cascading multiple uh, noisy components to make a uh, a better component out of it. Then both uh, Cesar from Mexico and Bacau from uh, France ask, is it possible to build quantum gates that work with photons correlated in time or could a temporal degree of freedom be used? That's right, yeah, yeah. I mentioned it at the, the very start. Uh, you can use time. Uh, so let's go back to the start. You can use this encoding in time. So think about, so this is uh, on the X here is time and the encoding can be, you know, you have, if you have two pulses that the photon can be in, you can encode the qubits of being, you know, zero if it's in the first part, so one is in the second part. And you can make all sort of uh, gates uh, in, a similar, in a similar way as we do for past, just there you need the fast, uh, fast switches essentially, because you need to operate uh, the different operation on the zero and the one. So you need fast, fast switches to make this operation. But, Principle you can, yeah, and people do. Then is a photonic quantum computer programmable or is it built for a couple of standard algorithms? Standard algorithms, Abdella from Algeria asks. No, no, it's fully, it's fully, it's universal quantum computation. So um, I briefly mentioned that this, this um, measurement based quantum computation that you can perform on this. Uh, I, yeah, I'm going up and down with the slides, sorry about that. So essentially, if we so essentially this lattice here is a, a square lattice. Um, if you if you generate it essentially this by just by just performing single by just performing single qubit measurements on each on each of these qubits, you can perform uh, universal quantum computation using this uh, measurement based quantum computing uh, framework. Uh, so so really here we are talking about universal quantum computation and for tolerant quantum computation, not only specific. You know, special purpose uh, device. Great. Back to the fusion gates. Nasser from Algeria asks, can you please explain again what happens after the fusion gates are applied? Do we obtain entangled states that are not destroyed in the end? So, yes. So, so here we're just measuring this. So the, the problem, the problem with this gate is that we are measuring two of the photons, right? And those photons, they are measured, so they are destroyed. The photon is measured, you, you know, it's absorbed by the detector and it's it. But these photons are not are not so the the, the, the important point is that these photons are not they're not separable, but they are entangled with the with another set of, uh, of photons of, of qubits, and those and those qubits are not measured. So those qubits exist uh, and and uh, and they get fused into this larger uh, entangled state, and so you know you need larger and larger uh, entanglement. So some of the photons are destroyed, are consumed to do these fusions, but this leaves with undestroyed photons that can be useful for uh, for uh, generating entanglement. Then back to the emission of photons. Fish asks, can you control the emission of photons? Control. Yes. So, um, so okay. Depends what you want to control. There, there, are, there are many things that you want to control. So, um, so one of the things that you want to control is, for example, the time at, at which the photon is uh, it's uh, it's generated. And this you can by just you know uh, changing. So he, so here we have a, a bright laser pulses that are arriving uh, to drive our single photon source. If you just control uh, the time at which those pulses arrive at the source, then you're controlling this, the, the time at which the photons are generated. Um, another way of doing it is using this, this the spin uh, to make this, uh, this entangled state. Um, then you can also, for example, uh, control the frequency of the photons that are being emitted and so on. You, you can tune the source, uh, the, the source uh, frequency. 
and, and so on. So yes, you have you have you have the uh, controllability over uh, not all, but a good a good amount of the research. Yeah, and there are several manufacturers that really focus on creating these photon sources. That's right. Yeah, yeah, it's a hot. Uh, <laughs> Bigger hot picture thing. question. Are there applications that photonic quantum computing is uniquely suited for? So, so I mean, one one unique uh, capabilities of photons of like, photonic technology in general is that is this uh, you know long range transmission. So, which, which makes photonic kind of unique. If you if you really want to transmit over kilometers, uh, at the moment I mean photonics is kind of the it's a unique platform that I allow you to do that, which is good. I mean. That has, 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 as was being discussed in the previous uh, in the previous uh, the previous platform. Now we have, you know, there are many platforms, and we don't know each of them has pros and cons, and we don't know really which one of them uh, is going to be, you know, the ultimate one to make quantum processors. But uh, but photons are kind of the unique one that makes uh, long range transmissions at the moment. So that's the, you know, the specific application where photons are really unique. And one other advantage is related to the following question. Johanna from Germany, at what temperatures are the experiments conducted? Right. Uh, so in, so if you, the only thing that really needs to be at, at uh, low temperature is the superconducting the vapor. So that's the only thing. And, and you also want it probably for this quantum dots to suppress the phonons, uh, phonon side bands. Anyway, all the rest can be done. Like, this type of sources and the circuits can operate uh, at the room temperature. So, so yeah, it's, it's the, there is no there is no problem with that. Uh, so, in principle, all of this can be made. Uh, all of this can be made at room temperature. You only need the phonon detectors if you know to be a cryo temperature. If you really care about high efficiency, so low losses. But it's, yeah. Then there are questions about additional reading material and specific material, I will send an email to you to get those for you. Please do, yeah. Then, oh yeah, Yusuf from Germany had a question about Anderson localization. Anderson localization in light. Let me skip back to that question. Yes, do you observe Anderson localization? Because it is known that the quantum percolation threshold is higher than the classical percolation threshold due to interference. Right, right. So. <laughs> There has been experiments on on Anderson locality. So let me let me let me. So it's difficult. I mean, it's, it's, uh, So in terms of percolation, I don't know. I don't know exactly how to answer in terms of percolation. But Anderson localization of uh, of photons uh, propagating through disordered uh, disordered medium has been observed. So for example, uh, one can think of uh, this. Uh, let's see. Let's see if you if you see this uh, lattice on the background of this of this image, this can be just seen as kind of a random walk uh, where uh, all of if all of these are being split as uh, this can be seen as a random walk where all of the photons get like a half half probability of uh, of of, of, of uh, being split at each uh, at each being splitter, and they interfere at them as well. So if you had disorder in here, meaning for example adding phases, random phases or random uh, you know uh, being split that are not 50 50 but 60 40 for example, then you add disorder and you can really see um, Anderson localization in the interference pattern. So the interference pattern spreads fastly across the way, across the modes. Um, so in terms of uh, using it for full torrent, I'm not aware of any work on that, but, uh, but uh, yeah, that's a good question. Yes, great. Zakaria from Spain says, so could one say that Quantum photonic computers are ideal for super dense coding due to their long coherence time. Yes, super dense coding. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm not exactly, I'm not familiar with super dense coding. So the, so one of the, one of the nice things of the photons, as we say, as we were saying, is that also they, you know, they have, they, they, they have multiple degrees of freedoms uh, where you can encode qubits. Uh, and so a way you can encode your kind of uh, that you can increase your uh, encoding capabilities is to use multiple degrees of freedom at the same time. So people have done using uh, you know having a, having a, having a, a multiple qubits, so one in the one in the path, one in the polarization, one in the frequency. I don't know. Uh, 
so yes, yeah, so those, that you can use it will increase your uh, you know, key distribution rates, for example. One question that we ask to almost all speakers is, what is your view on the future of the physical implementations of quantum computing? We have superconducting quantum computing, trap ion, neutral atom. Now you presented photonic to us. What will be the winner? Will there be a winner? Will there be a winner in certain areas? What are your I views? Mean, uh, I really don't know. I suspect that it's going to be a hybrid uh, platform. So not, none of the platforms that we that we're seeing, <laughs> that we've seen so far. So it, it's probably it's probably going to be it's probably going to be something where you have qubits dedicated to a particular task and qubits dedicated to some other particular task. So for example, I can envisage you know a, a, I mean, uh, you know. A modular platform where you have a superconducting or trapped ion qubits that uh, perform local that perform localized quantum computation and then photons that are transmitted to create a network of, of, of processors and so on. So that's that's uh, that's I think how it would likely proceed. Yeah, that is a great point. Exploiting the advantages of the photons. Bakao had an early question: Can you use squeeze states to have better measurements? That's a good question. Yes. So um, there are multiple ways you can use <laughs> squid states for. So so one of the things. So here, here I'm just uh, I'm just um, this. Uh, you know, I, 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 I presented the encoding of a qubit into a single photon, but you know you can also encode. The, there are ways to encode qubits into squid states of light uh, as well. I mean, you, you you can process quantum information in, into squid using squeeze sets of flights directly. So that, that would be a completely different encoding using these continuous variables, uh, photonic quantum uh, approaches. Um, then another way so that squeezing can be useful is, for example, uh, one, one usage is that the, um, I mentioned those, those, those fusion gates have 50% probability. But people also show that if you feed in a, a squid state into here instead of single photons, then you can boost the probabilities. I mean, you also need to change the situation a little bit, but uh, you can also boost the probability of this uh, of this um, uh, of this of this gate happening. Um, so that's another possible use of speed states for photonic quantum computing. You know, because you know, boost, boosting this probability means that you have you increase the density of the links that are created, that have been created in the lattice. And that's, then that's before we have more physics. Can you go back to the beginning where you had the slide with many quantum companies? Right. Arkham is asking, can you post the list? Right, yes, sorry. <laughs> Here yes, we I go, will. take your snapshot now. And we see several that are familiar for, uh, to us. Orca Computing, we had on Saturday, Richard Murray speaking, the CEO and founder of Orca Computing. Tomorrow we will have Quicks Quantum showing a lab tour and their photonic devices. We will have PsyQuantum here on the left at the career fair, and you can ask many questions to them. And with several others, we are also in touch. So many opportunities there. Arkan, you have taken your screenshot, and then we will move on to some more physics questions and technical questions. Nasser from Algeria asks, is it possible to perform parallel computations by encoding multiple states on the multiple degrees of freedom of photons at the same time? Well, yes, I mean, in principle, yes. I mean, the, the problem is that uh, the, you know, it's already, it's already quite difficult to build <laughs> a quantum computer just using one degree of freedom. Now using more uh, simultaneously is gonna be Add, add challenges to that, of course. Uh, uh, so you can do you, so you, you can do you can you can do that for uh, to kind of parallelize your computation. You can also do that to encode, uh, uh, you know, for example, qubits into this into this um, into this uh, into a single photon. So, for example, you know, if you have, you can see zero. You know, a top a top qubit in the H polarization is zero. Then you have a zero one, which is a one. Uh, one zero is a two. One one is a three, and so on. Uh, and so, you know, higher dimensional systems into a single spot, and that's something that you can do as well. And um, yeah, I mean, at, at the moment, I would say the advantages of all of these are not clear. Like, uh, if, if they if uh, if they would if it will give any architectural advantages to build up to the quantum computers, but uh, these are all possible uh, pathways that you want to look at. Yeah. 
Yeah, great question, Nasser, and really thinking ahead. Mustafa, I will send your question to uh, Stefano so there is no confusion about the notation and interpretation. Then could you go back to the entanglements and give a brief recap for uh, Miguel who asked, I think you already mentioned, how did you entangle the photonic qubits, but could you repeat it? Do you use C0 gates to accomplish this or is it different? So, did I use C0 gates? So, um, so this is not a, it's, it's not a C0 gate. So you can see this as a, all right. Um, so this is, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a really different way of performing computation, what we're using. So actually you can use, you can concede, you can look at each of these links as a kind of synod gate, if you want, between these two qubits. And this, you can make the analog of it using the, for example, this quantum emitter. So the quantum, the quantum emitting generating entangled sets, you can see those as, uh, it's reading a photon and then making a synod with it, or control case with it and so on. But this operation here is really kind of different. It's really diff it's, it's different from uh, applying, you know, a, a qubit qubit gate because the measurement is included into it. So it's, 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 it's different, it's intrinsically different from making kind of a C. Uh, I mean, I, I guess you can see it as kind of a, making a, a CZ, a control phase between these two and then measuring these two, probabilistically. So in that sense, you can see that, but uh, uh, it's really, it's really, there is no, con there is no concept of control phase in entering into this circuit. Essentially. It's really just using the interference of photon to make it the equivalent of choosing uh, entangled states. Raisa asks, since photonic quantum computers grow in size when you add more equipment, what are possible ways to decrease that? Right, so the, right, right, right. So, so one of the advantages of photonic quantum computing is that, uh, you know, if you just take one of these sources uh, generating photons, you know, in principle, you generate them a gigahertz, so in principle, you have a thousand photonic, you know, a gigahertz, a billion of photonic qubits coming out of your system. Uh, per second. Uh, so, so in principle, you know, to make a very large entangled state, uh, even, even, you know, if, even just one, if you, have, if you had no losses, just one quantum emitter would be enough for it. Uh, so they have this, uh, um, so, and you can also think of, you know, we need, we need many of these, uh, well, we need, many, we need many of these small resource states, uh, but this, need, you know, they can also come, uh, they, they, they don't need to come necessarily from different sources. They can also all come from the same source, for example, and just have some router that defines uh, how, how this, you know, in which circuits each photon is going to enter. Um, so, so, so photonics has the advantage that to scale it up, you don't necessarily need to increase the size, the, the hard, you know, the, 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 the size of your hardware, but you can just play tricks of, uh, um, you know, delaying photons into the long fibers and, and have a router that decides uh, where they are gonna end up, essentially. Of course, the, most, the more, uh, if we had, if we had uh, one uh, emitter per, uh, per here, that would be, even, you know, if, if you had the capability to make them, it would be even greater, but uh, in principle, photonics has this advantage that you don't need, uh, it's very modular, so you don't need uh, necessarily to scale up your hardware to make a larger and larger uh, computations. Three more questions and then we will conclude. Sharma asks, can you recycle the photons that did not make coincidence measurements through the swap gate to increase the probability of entanglement? So can we reuse the photons? That's a good question. So the, the um, it's a very good question. Um, the answer is no. <laughs> I mean, I don't, see, I don't see any trivial way of doing it. At the moment, but uh, I don't see anything. Uh, essentially, if you have if, if a photon has a detection in its path, uh, and that detection uh, didn't happen, that that path is uh, is uh, you need to delete it from your uh, from your system. The, the, yes. So all, all the detections are destructive in photonics. So there is no recycling of a, a, a detected you know, or, or a non-detected detected photon. Uh, I might have some ideas how to do it, but uh, it's not, it's, let's say, let's say no. <laughs> it's a very good Great. question. Almost last question. This is your last chance to uh, put questions on Discord. Johanna from Germany asks, 
I heard about using photons for long range interaction between other qubits, for example, spin qubits. Can you comment on that? Yeah, yeah, this is, uh, this is related to what we were uh, discussing before on you know, using photons to add modularity in processors. Uh, I of Q, probably you, they, they, they talked about it in the, in the previous, um, in the previous um, lecture. Uh, you know, they, they, I think they, they, are, they are pushing this road where you just have trapped ions. Uh, so you, you have these uh, qubits uh, that makes your, uh, your, uh, your processors uh, and you can use photons to link between them, to, to, to share entanglement between them. So to do this, you need qubits that are uh, kind of optically active so that you, know, you can transduce the quantum information into a photonic, uh, into a photonic qubit, which is non-trivial, uh, but, in principle, yes, this is, this is a very good way to add modularity between, uh, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a quantum network or a network quantum computer. Wonderful. With that, we will conclude the session. Thank you very much. This was Stefano Paisani from the Niels Bohr Institute, University of Copenhagen. Thank you very much for this great lecture. Very Thank insightful, you. well explained. And we hope everyone is very enthusiastic enthusiastic about photonic quantum computing now and have a great perspective in comparing different technologies and the advantages and disadvantages of all. I will stay on for a few minutes. Rush will stay on for a few minutes too for general questions about the program and what is coming up. And Stefano, thank you again. Wish you a great evening in Europe. Thanks to you, it was really a pleasure. Have a good evening. With that, thank you very much, everyone. Tomorrow session by Quix Quantum with a lab tour and more questions for you to ask about photonic quantum computing. So digest today's lecture, read more, read about what companies are doing and ask those questions tomorrow to Quix, both about the physics, technical parts and entrepreneurship. They are a startup, very young startup, just a few years ago. And then we will have Q Silver with Gibran to continue the quantum programming journey. Feel free to leave now. I will stay on a few minutes in case there are questions about the general program. And if you don't have them, we see each other tomorrow. Thank you all very much. Yes, there is a question about the hackathon. This Friday, we will have the hackathon introduction. So then all information will be given about the timeline, about the team formation, and the challenges will be revealed. The short descriptions of the challenges will be given to you, and you can have a look what you're interested in. How will the team building happen? After the session on Friday, there will be the opportunity to stay on the Zoom to network and chat with each other. The same will happen on Sunday when we have the happy hour. There will be breakout rooms on Zoom and Discord to get to know each other further, look for good teammates. Ideal team size is around four people, uh, but we ask for two to six people to build your team. If you really want to do it alone, it is possible, but we really advise to do this in a team. They are big projects for two weeks, so it is really meant as a team effort to get to your goal here. We received more great challenges from Quantinium in quantum chemistry and uh, natural language processing. We have a challenge from Orca in the photonic quantum computing field. Deloitte, a very applied case, how we can use quantum computing to make our life, and in this specific case, supermarkets greener. All details you will hear on Friday, stay tuned. A few more questions, hackathon related to biology. Um, there is no question, no challenge posed by companies uh, that is related to biology or pharmaceutical applications, but you also have the freedom to, uh, to propose your own hackathon challenge. 
your own innovation for the technical advances or how to build your startup out of it. So if you're interested in this, propose it yourself or get in touch with companies to uh, have the idea together. Yes, I see several details coming up. They will all be answered on Friday, so in only two days, and then all hackathon challenges will be revealed. I think in the meantime, what are you really interested in yourself? And then you also have the opportunity to propose your own hackathon challenge. The deadline for that will be August 5th for both the team building and signing up for challenges. With that, we will conclude the session. Thank you all very much. We will see each other tomorrow. And then on Friday, all the details for the hackathon. And Saturday, career training. Monday, career fair. And even more companies have signed up. So have your resume ready on Canvas. You finish QBronze. You will practice your pitch on Saturday. And then you're all set for the career fair on Monday to interact with all those companies including the photonic quantum computing companies, Quix and Orca. Raj, I see you're here too. Anything to add to conclude the session? Nothing to add, Marlu. Everything was great. And there are some people who had recommended bringing speakers from Zapata and IQM. And indeed, we do have the CEOs of both of those companies coming and speaking to you. So that is just one brief addition. Otherwise, we can conclude today's session. Thank you all very much. Have a great rest of the day or night, and we will see each other tomorrow. Rush, you will close the Zoom. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.